Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, for the record, Floyd Krasonski, House District 4, the State Representative. Um, I've brought together a panel to uh, discuss the issue of industrial hemp production within the state of Oregon, and I wanted to bring this panel to you so you could hear for them, uh, from them directly as to the reason why I believe it's an it's appropriate time for us to get beyond the, uh, uh, the myths of uh, industrial hemp and get to the reality of what we really are needing to accomplish and allowing for our farmers to do. It's uh, for the history of this bill, I actually brought a bill uh, forward two years ago in the uh, session at that time, basically providing for the same uh, service of allowing farmers to be able to go into production of industrial hemp. The reasons I got involved in this is the uh, person that is sitting to my left here uh, is uh, Carolyn Moran. Uh, Carolyn is the owner of Living Tree Paper, which is a uh, company in Eugene, Oregon, uh, that does in fact uh, produce paper that is non-wood product uh, based. It does in fact include industrial hemp as part of the, uh, uh, of the paper that she does produce. Uh, we have sent out and we have provided each of the members with a packet of uh, various different in, in, uh, items for your inspection and review, including some uh, data that has come from different studies. I also in 1996, or I should say 1997, and, uh, bringing that bill forward at that time, had another constituent who's now uh, relocated into the uh, state of Colorado uh, by the name of Sue and her husband, Don Smith. They are the owners of Smith, or Adventure Smith, which is a textile. I have to my left a green shirt or jacket, uh, which I brought in for your, uh, your uh, observations or touch and feel, which is a product of uh, Adventure Smith uh, that I have actually uh, purchased from them, and the hat that's with it is a hat that I purchased this last fall down in uh, Tempe, Arizona, uh, that is also made as industrial hemp. I, uh, in speaking with Phil Moran, it came very clear to me uh, that we were basically providing a disservice and misinformation regarding a viable crop, and the more uh, research I did, she encouraged me back in 1996 to attend a conference that was put on by the North American Industrial Hemp Council. This is a uh, group that has been organized for approximately uh, four years, if I'm not mistaken. And it's made up basically of individuals throughout the country uh, with a, uh, I guess, a concentration of people in the Midwest, Kentucky, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Indiana, and Ohio uh, that have been uh, very active in, in attempting to reintroduce, and I want to say that again, reintroduce a crop that has uh, been uh, able to be grown in this country uh, legally up until sometime in the early 70s. The, uh, what I learned from my uh, research is that basically we have had a, uh, a crop that was in fact uh, very viable, that found its way through a marketing process of being, let's say, pushed out of the market uh, because of other interest, uh, competing interests that were able to prevail. And that was in the wood uh, product industry as to a, a shifting uh, pulp or wood fiber into pulping for paper and the other area was because of the onslaught of the production of cotton uh, with the petrochemical industry being uh, very uh, excited about that because of the amount of pesticides that are necessary to, uh, to be used in the production of cotton. What I'm asking this committee to do is to put aside the, uh, the myths that many people have heard and listened to the individuals that are uh, accompanying me today, and I know there's other people that will be testifying. I will want to make a comment before our time is over uh, regarding uh, some of the uh, statements that I expect that you will be hearing both from law enforcement as well as a study that has been done at OSU regarding the feasibility of having industrial hemp compete in a uh, wood fiber uh, uh, market. Now, if you've had an opportunity to review the material that's been brought to your uh, attention yesterday through uh, committee, uh, uh, Mr. Collins is very appreciative of receiving it. You know, I want to thank him for providing and distributing the material that we've sent out. <coughs> the one thing I want to bring out to you is that we in Oregon are in the position to become the second state to, again, reinstitute industrial hemp as an agricultural crop in the United States. And I say second because of Saturday, a week now, this past Saturday, the governor of North Dakota signed into production or into law a bill that will in fact allow production of industrial hemp in the state of North, uh, North Dakota. 
I, fi I find that very intriguing, and the reason I would tell you that this has happened in that state, and you have to realize that North Dakota is not the same best in their uh, liberal uh, philosophies, is because the farmers there recognized and realized that they had an the opportunity to go back to what many of their forefathers had done previously, and that is to actually be in the production and growing of industrial hemp. To the north of North Dakota is Canada. Canada opened up their markets and legalized the production of industrial hemp in 1998. And because of that, I think many people that are closer to the production uh, in Canada realized that they were being basically cut out of a market. And that market is very important. I believe that we can, in fact, establish and really position the state of Oregon for the future. Clearly, it's my opinion and my projection that you will, in fact, see production of industrial hemp on a um, more of a nationwide basis within a five-year period from today. You may ask, well, why do we have to do something now? Are we kind of putting ourselves out the long run? And I would say to you that if we don't position ourselves immediately, we're going to be playing a catch-up game. One thing that we have the ability to do in this state, no other state in this country and this country has been able to do, is establish itself as a seed base uh, for grass seed. Uh, we are world-renowned for our grass seed. We have the ability to, uh, I think, take that technology and that ability to uh, produce uh, top high-quality seed from the grass seed and move it into the uh, area of industrial hemp. This would, aim, in fact, would be a, a, a area that I would believe that would be very beneficial for us to look at as setting ourselves on the market. Myself and the chair have talked over the last two years at different times regarding his concerns of trying to bring some type of commodity to the state without having a market. Well, the reality is there's never been, in this country's history, the uh, decision to prohibit the growing of any type of commodity based on whether or not there's an economic market for it. And to me, I would say that what we need to do is allow the area to open up and the market will, in fact, present itself. And the reason I can say that with uh, great faith is because of what has uh, actually occurred in Canada. Uh, because they've opened up their market uh, two years ago, you now have another area within Canada that's positioned themselves very close to where the crop is being grown to be the processor of industrial hemp in Canada. And that's where we need to be looking at in the future today instead of waiting until it has passed us uh, by. Just a brief history of industrial hemp within the United States. Prior to 19, uh, 19, 1937, when the Marijuana uh, Tax Act was passed, there was uh, little to no restrictions uh, regarding uh, the ability to grow industrial hemp in this country. At that point, there were, uh, uh, I'm going to say, uh, requirements to start moving into <coughs> the main process that was required. And as I mentioned about the competing interests of wood and cotton, uh, or I should say wood fiber and cotton, you started to see the industrial hemp market uh, uh, diminishing because of, of their inability to really come up and, and move as, far, as fast as they needed to. One of the things that I've found in my research is what I call the hypocriticalness of this area where we've had a lot of studies and uh, talk as to what we don't want to do and what we do want to do. I think it's very important for the community members to understand in 1942, uh, the United States government found that it was uh, lacking in the ability to provide rope and canvas that we needed uh, because of the war, World War II and our uh, sources being cut in the uh, Philippines and in the uh, Southeast Pacific. At that point in time, we started a subsidized program on the federal level known as Hemp for Victory, where farmers throughout the Midwest and throughout other parts of the country were in fact asked and encouraged to uh, move forward in producing hemp for the war effort. Uh, the commercial production continued up into the 50s, uh, and sometime in the, uh, the mid-50s, commercial production, as far as I've been able to trace, uh, diminished to the point of where it was no longer occurring. In, 19, in the early 70s, uh, when DEA took over its uh, farmer organization, it then reclassified the definition of marijuana that did, in fact, encompass uh, industrial hemp. So it's only been in the last 25 years, thereabouts, that industrial hemp has actually been illegal to grow in this country. But prior to that, with certain restrictions as to the permitting that was required, it could be grown, in a, and even before that, there was no restrictions at all, and the market just went to bear as to what would happen. Representative Krasinski, on that, on that <coughs> thing, is it the federal government, or is it now left up to the states to make these decisions? No, sir. Uh, at this point, you have, we have what I'm going to call a bifurcated process. Uh, Mr. Hickey, uh, who is to my right, will go into greater detail, but very briefly what I'll tell you is that the DEA, and we have uh, letters, I believe the letters have come in your packet, 
uh, regarding uh, their position in this sense. Uh, they are in, in the process of repositioning and rethinking their, uh, their opposition to it being reintroduced as an industrial crop. And the reason for that is because now the market is starting to show and flourish within this country from industrial hemp being imported to this country. And that's the part I find very hypocritical, is because none, no farmers in this country right now can grow industrial hemp, but the person to my left is forced to import the industrial hemp that she uses in making her paper. And it seems to me that farmers in this country should, in fact, be allowed to have the ability to grow that crop if they deem it to be a marketable crop for them. And again, that's why I believe in the seed production for certified seed. There's no other place besides the Willamette Valley that I know in this country that can better position itself in the seed production, at least for the Northwest. Here's so, I ask you, I'm still a little confused. If, if we were to, to pass a bill to allow this to be grown in Oregon, where do the feds come into the issue as far as, as uh, allowing this to be grown now? Uh, I'll give you a brief in, uh, response and Joe uh, Hickey will over it. The bottom line is it will force the uh, federal government, uh, the DEA specifically, to rethink and, and, uh, as to what they're going to do or not. Uh, I think it's best for me at this point to introduce uh, the people to my left and to my right so they can have their input and then we can open up for discussions. Um, just one quick, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one question. Um, isn't it true, uh, Representative Fernandez, that North Dakota has already authorized uh, the growing of hemp, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Overlaw, that is correct. <coughs> Saturday, this past Saturday, the governor of North Dakota signed into law the production of industrial hemp, making it legal to grow, possess, uh, to uh, uh, process everything that you would need to do and want to do to, uh, to make the market. Is now can occur in the state of uh, North Dakota. But as the chair mentioned, that brings us to the next issue as to how the, uh, the federal government is going to respond to this. And, and that was my next question, if I could, Mr. Chair. Um, has, has the DEA weighed in at all on, uh, on the Dakota uh, discussion? Not at, um, Mr. Chair, Matt, uh, Representative Overall, not at this point. <coughs> We got to remember the ink has just dried on that bill at this past Saturday. It's not even a week since it's actually been signed. The one thing I want you to understand is that it passed both the House and the Senate in North Dakota overwhelmingly. Uh, I mean, it was very lopsided and it was little to no opposition. And again, I, I attribute that because of their close proximity to the production of industrial hemp in Canada and their determination that they wanted their, mark, their farmers to be able to market. Now, I have to my, uh, to my left. Uh, Carolyn Moran, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Carolyn is one of the two people who live in my district who brought this uh, to my attention back in 1996, prior to me introducing the bill in 1997. Uh, Carolyn is the owner of Living Tree Paper, and I'm going to ask her to uh, make comments, but before I do that, so I want to go to the next introduction. Joe Hickey is to my right. Uh, Joe Hickey is from uh, Kentucky. He is associated with the Kentucky Hemp's Grower uh, Cooperative. He's the executive director. Mr. Hickey, I met at a uh, conference back in 1996 and was very impressed at, as to the items that they were producing and uh, were advocating for for many different individuals. And he will be giving the perspective as a farmer. He uh, used to be a farmer, but because of his uh, duties now as the executive director, uh, he's had to put that kind of to the side as many of us would recognize as to our professions. I do want to mention to the members that we have here in display on the corner that's to my, or the table to my left, various products that are in fact being legally produced in this country, uh, but again, it's requiring for the production or the use of materials that are being imported into the country. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and Representatives. Um, my reason for being here is pretty obvious since I have a business that requires uh, non-wood fibers, specifically hemp fibers for making Karen, hemp. Karen, can you say your name? Oh, I'm sorry, oh, Carolyn. Tape. Oh, we have a name on your table. Uh, Carolyn Moran. Oh, thank you. Um, at any rate, um, we make paper uh, for the printing and writing industry out of uh, hemp and flax and post-consumer waste. And historically, paper was not made out of uh, wood pulp. It was made out of uh, cotton rag and hemp and flax and linen. It's only been recently that we've been making paper out of wood. Um, as Floyd said, we have to import and support uh, a foreign economy to 
uh, support our business. We import pulp from Spain and France. It's been grown there for decades, and we support the farmers there. It's a, it's a small farming um, community that, that grows hemp in Spain and France. There's like 30 or 40 small farmers, farmers that are collective, and they create the uh, resource for the pulp um, facility, which is also in Spain. And then we have to ship the pulp to the United States. So that's a lot of expense for us which makes our pulp very, very expensive compared to wood pulp. I feel if we, if we were able to grow hemp and pulp it right here, local economy and local uh, resource, that should change dramatically and we should be able to compete to some degree with wood paper. Um, just right now, um, hemp paper, besides what, what we do in the printing and writing race, it's used in cigarette papers and it's used in some currencies. Um, the economics of uh, making paper out of hemp straw, flax, I mean, I would include all those in this, in this process. Because hemp, actually, the best thing that hemp can do is, is uh, put a, a percentage of it in another furnace, such as straw or post-consumer waste, and it makes a super high quality sheet. It's a very, very uh, high quality paper making uh, fiber because it's very long. Um, now, the economics of this, um, which probably some of you know since we are a pulp and paper state, um, the market for printing and writing paper is approximately 30 million tons per year. Um, paper consumption is, is, is growing rapidly. Um, a couple years ago, paper consumption was 280 million tons. By the year 2010, they, they expect it to be 420 million tons worldwide. So that is a, quite a growth. And there, it's going to be automatic that people are going to be using other fibers besides um, wood for pulp and paper be it hemp, like I say, flax or straw. Um, the demand for non-wood fibers has grown, the demand for hemp has grown, and that's from mostly due to um, organizations and a lot of retail business and a lot of media and, uh, and the legalization of industrial hemp in Canada. <coughs> so I feel like, I'm oh, sorry. Probably will get some interruptions. The, the world paper market is about the softest I've ever seen it. Most of our uh, mills are being shut down, closed down the big one at Reedsport. Is this market for hemp fiber different than the one that's come from wood fiber? I mean, is it that much different that it has a different niche in the marketplace? Yes, Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, it definitely does. It, um, I know that about the, the paper industry. It's pretty amazing because our business is growing. It's grown five times what it was last year. And the market is a niche market, it's an environmental market, it's partly the natural products market, which is growing at 15 to 20 percent a year, it's a 20 billion dollar market. These types of companies want to use, incorporate more environmental papers into their marketing and into their, you know, products. So it is definitely a niche. Bigger paper companies are coming to us now because they see that as a, a growing niche because, you're right, the paper industry is flat right now. But it's a cyclical thing, I believe, too, and it's going to change, you know. Um, so I was just going to, you know, just give a little bit of what hemp, you know, what it takes to, um, I mean, hemp produces three to eight tons of dry fiber per acre every year. Um, so, you know, year after year, you're going to get, you know, a lot of fiber for paper for, you know, whatever. And the seed, I think would be the first um, economic value, though. It would be the easiest to process. You know, and there's a lot of uh, natural food companies that are using the seed now for um, their products. So basically, I just think that it could provide um, new income and new opportunity for Oregon. Yeah. Thank you. Carolyn, just briefly, you say you import uh, hemp. How do you import it? I, I, I'm assuming it, it comes in various forms to you? No, we only import it in pulp form, dry pulp okay. form. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, yeah. and a follow-up question. You're currently paying how much for that? Mr. Chair, Representative, quite a bit, $2,500 a ton, which is probably, Ooh. what, five times what wood pulp is. We use 25%, so we are a high-end specialty printing and running rate, but we do compete with um, other <coughs> consumer papers of this type. Thank you. Go 
Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Hickey is going to go next. Just for the individuals who uh, may have come in the room late, we do have a belt of uh, fiber here, which is industrial hemp. And so this kind of shows you what the uh, end product is once it's uh, basically cut out of the field and it's been dried. Now that's not the same fiber she's talking about, though, now. When, when you, Carolyn, is mm -hmm. this the same thing you're talking yes. about? Yes, this is, is this what this stage they, right here? This no. is what, no, 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 that's not that stage. You don't have a sample of what you buy? No, I don't have a sample of the pulp. It comes in, a, it's a flat sheet and it looks kind of white and it doesn't look anything like that. I'm just saying that's what we used to make it. So. Um, can I pass around a sheet of You can pass paper? around anything. Yeah, this is the paper that we made. Give it to Samantha. Um, Give it to Samantha over there. <coughs> He's the executive director. He was a farmer before he, as time became, let's say, more, bio, uh, 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 more valuable to the uh, Growers Association of trying to reintroduce uh, this product into the United States. Welcome, welcome to our industry. Um, so I want to tell you something up. Uh, I'm glad Mike, maybe we're over close to you there. Okay. Um, everyone can hear all right in the room. If you can't hear, raise your hands back there. Uh, uh, my grandfather was a farmer. I uh, uh, grew up uh, not on a farm, but working on a farm all the time. I've hauled enough tobacco and hay to probably fill this room with several times. Uh, North Dakota passed their bill uh, last, was a week ago last Monday. The Senate uh, passed the bill 44 to 3. The governor signed it on the 17th of April. Uh, it's now law in North Dakota that farmers uh, will be able to grow industrial hemp. The question raised was what do the federal, what does the federal government do at this point now that uh, legislation allows farmers to grow industrial hemp in North Dakota? There is regula a regulatory system in place, uh, oddly enough, it's uh, an agricultural crop is controlled by the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. At this point, if a farmer in North Dakota wanted to grow industrial hemp, they would have to fill out a enormous amount of paperwork. Uh, they would probably have to fill it out now to grow it next year, and it's completely up to the federal government whether or not uh, they want to let that particular farmer grow industrial hemp. Where this came from was a law in 1937 called the Marijuana Tax Act. It basically put the crop in the control of the uh, uh, Department of Drug Control. The reason for that was because they, at that time, didn't know the difference between uh, industrial hemp and pot. Now they know the difference. There's ways of looking at it. The in Hawaii, they are, have, have a bill that looks like it's going to pass also. On December 4th, 1998, U.S. <coughs> Senator Daniel Inouye received a letter from the Justice Department, the heads of the DEA, Thomas Constantine. Yeah, I think we have a copy of that letter here. <coughs> uh, you'll see in there in the bottom, it says, with respect to hemp due to the recent commercial interest in its cultivation, DEA is reviewing the security re regulations pertaining to the cultivation of cannabis sativa. So they are in, um, you know, they are looking at how they're going to do this. They have to do this now, now that North Dakota has um, you know, passed the bill. We ha also have from the New York Times, General McCaffrey, a statement from him is a quote that says, to the extent you want to grow uh, hemp fiber, we'd be glad to work with you. 
So General McCaffrey now has come off of his stance, Mr. Chairman, that you know uh, this would send the, the wrong message to the youth. And what I was here's a short statement which really puts the the thing about the, send the wrong message to the youth in context. It says keeping hemp illegal glamorizes it in the eyes of youth, which is true. It keeps it forbidden fruit. By sending the message that the authorities disapprove of hemp, you tell the kids that they can express their distrust of authority and desire to reveal by purchasing hemp products. Legalizing hemp removes the wind from the sale of this rebellion. <coughs> hemp products are already legal. Keeping hemp products illegal creates a bond to marijuana that would not otherwise be there. That's just absolutely a true statement. I also would like to point out that the United States is the only country in the NATO alliance, it's the only country in the, the G7 uh, economic group that doesn't allow their farmers to grow industrial hemp. In the land of the free, the home of the brave, the country that espouses the most personal freedoms of any country in the world, doesn't give their farmers the same latitude as former countries that were under communist rule. You know, I mean, where's, I don't understand the, the rationale. The only thing that, that we, the only group of people that you'll find that will come up and testify that industrial hemp uh, is going to send the wrong message, that it's uh, economically <coughs> not viable, you know, which you tell that to the uh, Canadian farmers that are getting $225 an acre last year, tell them that it's not economically viable. Representative Hobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You mentioned the countries that did allow the growing. What are the countries who do forbid it? I assume there are some, or you wouldn't make the distinction. The, there's countries, uh, I would say, in uh, South America that, that you know don't have a history of growing that uh, that still don't grow it. Um, I, am I, is that because they have laws against it, or just because they haven't found it a viable product? I would say it's because they have laws against uh, the production of marijuana, and they haven't, you know, and they haven't historically grown industrial hemp. You you still have laws against the production of, of marijuana or pot in Canada. Why it's legal to grow? You, you know, when they you you hear the law enforcement people say, well, it's a slippery slope. Once you legalize industrial hemp, then marijuana is going to be next. Why isn't marijuana legal in? Uh, in the Ukraine, why isn't it legal in France? Why isn't it legal in Canada? Why isn't it legal in England? You know, none of these other countries have legalized uh, marijuana, but they still have not stopped the farmers from growing industrial hemp. Well, to move along here, on, you're from Kentucky. What are you What are you doing in Kentucky? Uh, my uh, business in Kentucky was um, uh, construction, heavy construction. I was in the as far as hemp. Oh, in what, Aren't you involved in hemp? Right. What we're doing is we're, we're importing hemp from Canada. We're, we've been doing research at North Carolina State University on um, uh, using the hemp fiber to make paper. We are feeding uh, beef uh, the seed. When you crush the seeds up, you have... Uh, well, what we're doing, we're feeding beef uh, hemp meal, which is the crushed seed where you take the oil out of it. We're not having to put, give them uh, antibiotics, no steroids, no hormones. We've got uh, basically environmentally friendly beef now uh, that, we're, that we're working with. We're working with feeding fish through the uh, Kentucky State University, because we're having great success with that. Uh, we have uh, had the University of Kentucky do an economic study on the viability of, uh, you know, what's the economic feasibility of industrial hemp. And what you'll, and I don't want everybody to be confused, there's two studies from the University of Kentucky. One study is about a four or five page study that 
says that, you know, hemp may be viable, but, you know, they're not really sure. That was done by the University of Kentucky's Agricultural uh, College, a student there. This study that was done by the University of Kentucky's Economic Department was done over a year and a half. Uh, the, the guys that put on the study, or that did the study, traveled all over the world collecting information. Uh, this study took, like I said, a year and a half. This study shows that industrial hemp has the potential for being uh, the crop that not could replace tobacco, but would allow farmers to have another crop that would allow them to survive on the, on the land that they're on. The, we also did a survey in Kentucky of uh, the residents of Kentucky. It was done on the same survey that the governor and the legislature do their uh, surveys to see what the, you know, what the general populace thinks. 77% of the people in Kentucky strongly or somewhat favor legislation that will allow farmers to grow industrial hemp. Representative Hill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you, Kentucky has a different environment in terms of, is Oregon's uh, climate uh, suitable in terms of as a, as a real estate place in terms of to grow it as a, a crop? We're going to be hearing from Oregon State. Uh, just a little bit absolutely. Here. Industrial hemp will grow, you know, it, it's growing in, in Canada. It will grow in uh, Texas. It will grow in California. It, they're growing it uh, right near Vermont. So in Canada. So it has a wide, you know, and that's the, you know, what's the last agricultural crop, major agricultural crop that was introduced to the American farmers? <laughs> about 70 years ago, it was, it was soybeans. That was the last major crop that's been introduced. And nobody thought then that, you know, they, you know, it's not a, it's a niche crop, you know, it's not, it's not something that's going to, you know, really provide income for farmers. Look what it did 70 years ago. You hear people say, well, there's no infrastructure, there's no place to process uh, industrial hemp. Using that same mentality, where would plastics be if we had to use that same mentality in the 20s and 30s, saying, well, there's no facility, <coughs> you know, there's no uses for plastic. 70 years later, everything that w you look around, everything is plastic. Plastics can be made from uh, carbohydrates. The majority of plastics now is made from hydrocarbons, oil. Hydrocarbons and carbohydrates are mirror images of each other. We've got plastics sitting right over here. Armani <coughs> is making plastics from industrial hemp. You've got car parts that are getting ready, that are being made prototypes are being made in Canada today that are that Ford Motor Company is looking at, that uh, General Motors, that all of the big uh, companies are looking at because they have got to go to recycled material. You've got uh, all kinds of uh, products, anything like that, anything that can be made from oil can be made from industrial hemp. Uh, Henry Ford back in 19... I think it was 4041 made a plastic car. It was made from jute, hemp, sisal, and soybean oil. Uh, there is a picture of Henry Ford hitting this car with a sledgehammer. The paint was in, mixed in, the pigment was mixed in with the plastics, and he made the car. On the third hit, the sledgehammer broke, the handle broke. This is what you know, we're looking at is a, a crop that will, well, Henry Ford's dream, and I think one of his statements was, the best place for modern man is one foot planted solidly in the soil, the other in industry. We want to bring the farmers back into the industrial loop. Uh, sure. uh, as, a, as a farmer, I'm always looking for alternative crops in the valley here that, that uh, would, would be helpful. Uh, and uh, I know that I actually have relatives who in, in years past uh, grew uh, industrial hemp uh, many, many years ago. My, and, and I don't have any problems with the concept in terms of marketing. I, I guess my great concern here is, is, as Floyd, you and I have talked previously about this issue, 
is that is this the camel with the nose under the intent or the, the tent? Are we ultimately leading to the legalization of marijuana? And, and that's been the concern of other farmers that have spoken to me about this issue in, in my area. One of the things that, as much as I dislike government regulation, uh, one of the areas that, because of the controversy of this issue, and because of the potential for uh, me to be growing a hemp, industrial hemp field, and someone next to me planting marijuana, and it looks very similar, how are we going to tell the differences? Would you be in support of the government regulating and actually selling the seed that is essentially denatured in its genetic ability to produce a hemp plant that has a lot of marijuana or THC? Mr. Chair, I'd like to respond to Bob. I'm going to let Mr. Hickey go first because I think there's two points that need to be made on that. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Kopp, uh, what you're looking at is a crop that can be considered anti-marijuana. The best thing that law enforcement could do would be to aerial seed the whole United States with industrial hemp. If you had a plant that was 1% THC, and I think the average THC is somewhere between 15 to 25, 30% in marijuana. If you have a, a, a marijuana plant and a hemp plant, when they cross-pollinate, if you have something that's 1% that cross-pollinates something that's 20%, it's going to bring down that THC level from 20% to 10% in one year. The following year, if they try to grow it outside, you know, the whole thing about trying to, to say that, well, you know, this is a slippery slope, you know, this is going to be legalizing marijuana. There was a lady in Vermont that testified last year that she testified against their industrial hemp bill because she said she didn't want the, the pollen uh, cross-pollinating with her marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> You know, causing it to, to dilute the, the quality of it. You know, well, if, that, if you Mr. try, Chair, to, that, that begs another question. Then, if 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 industrial hemp has one percent THC and it cross pollinates <coughs> with uh, a higher level in marijuana, uh, and marijuana comes down to ten percent, does the industrial hemp also come up to ten percent? Then, okay. Well, here's here's because you'll hear that, and that's that's what you'll hear the law enforcement say. But if you have a 100-acre field of industrial hemp and you put 20 marijuana plants in the middle of it, you know, you've got two problems. One is that when you process industrial hemp, you have to cut it down as soon as the male plant pollinates but for two reasons. When the male plant pollinates, it dies and you start to lose your fiber quality. When the female uh, is pollinated by the, the male, what happens there is she starts putting all her energy into producing seeds. So the fiber quality in the female starts to go down at that point. So you have to cut it as soon as it pollinates. It has no buds in it. You're talking about a 90 to 110 days. If you cut that field down now, and if you, in the middle of it, you have, let's say you have a 100 acre field, in the middle you have uh, you know, an acre. You cut down 99 uh, acres of hemp, you've got a one acre of marijuana sitting in the middle of your field out, you know, it's like pulling your pants down and showing everybody what you have. You know, I mean, there's no way that you can grow, it's impossible to grow marijuana in a hemp field and uh, do it covertly. <coughs> Mr. Chair? Yeah, yes. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Do, do you then, in terms of practical harvesting, and I'm, this is the farmer and me coming out, do you have to do like, like what we do with some specialized um, cabbage, uh, seed crops where you plant, or radish crops where you plant so many rows of female and then some rows of male and then female. I mean, you don't have to do that kind of thing. No. Uh, and let me let me read a quote from the Canadian <coughs> Bureau of Drug Surveillance. It's a quote from them: "No law enforcement problems related to the planting or cultivation of hemp in this country exist. They have no problem." You know, that's what I don't understand about the, the U.S. law enforcement. The U.S. law enforcement is the only law enforcement agency in the world that makes money off industrial hemp. The only law enforcement agency in the world that makes money off industrial hemp. There's a federal program called the Federal Cannabis 
uh, eradication slash suppression program. This program is funded by about $500 million a year. Vermont did a study, the legislators did a study, and this study showed 99.2% of, and they call it cannabis eradication program, they don't call it the marijuana eradication program because marijuana and hemp are both in the cannabis family. 99.2% of the cannabis they eradicated in the last eight, 10 years was ditch weed. So that, if you look at it in terms of $500 million, less than $5 million went to the eradication of marijuana and 400, over $495 million went to the eradication of ditch weed. Mr. Chair, move along. And Mr. Chair, can I just thank you. Um, I, I would kind of agree with in response to, to what you've been discussing in this literature that we have, there's a statement that studies at IU, Indiana University, um, indicate that industrial hemp would cross pollinate and destroy any marijuana in the vicinity. I assume that study is available, that we can get a copy? It, you know, yeah, I would think you could get a copy of that. We'll do our best to see if we can not bring that all from all online and get it to you. Mr. Chair, I guess a couple of things in the back of Representative Prop. Besides the cross-pollination, if you look at the bill, we've structured it where we're going to have the, the ability to have the Department of Agriculture, which in case, and in fact, will be able to share if they desire to, with law enforcement, every legitimate grower of industrial hemp. It will be a permitting process. And no one will be legally growing industrial hemp in this state if we pass this bill out and it becomes law, unless they're permitted. If they're not permanent, they're subject to a fine of up to $2,500. So law enforcement and the Department of Ag have the ability to not only know where the, uh, the industrial hemp fields are at, but to go out there and do inspections. And it would be, I think, pretty uh, unwise for an individual farmer to risk their land under asset forfeitures in this state to uh, basically have some type of uh, covert operation of trying to grow marijuana in between uh, their hemp because they basically can lose not only their land, their house and all of their uh, their their farm equipment because it would be uh, deemed to be facilitating that uh, that production illegal production. So the reality, I, I'm going to tell you that I believe that we have <coughs> the safeguards that are required within the bill. And I hope you've had an opportunity to go through the bill. What I can tell you is that we've defined out what the uh, definitions are for the different needs that we would have. We again have placed the ag uh, department or the Department of Agriculture in, in charge of regulating and has the ability to, in fact, to inspect and if they're doing any type of testing, uh, that they have a, a, a means of uh, requiring the, uh, the farmers to keep the, uh, the level of 1% or less. I want to tell you why we went in with 1% because we're not sure since this product has not been uh, grown in this uh, area for, uh, for over 25 years and probably close to 45 years, we do not have a seed base to uh, actually adapt to this, uh, to this uh, climate. And that's my understanding from my research and the people I've spoken with, that it's necessary to have the flexibility to establish the, uh, the, the appropriate seeds, the high quality in seeds. I can tell you in, in France, it has one of the larger seed uh, banks uh, that's used in Europe. Uh, I believe the production, <coughs> the uh, percentage of THC is 0.03. And so I think it's real important to realize that you can, in fact, and more than likely what we would see is way less than 1% of a THC level that would, uh, would uh, diminish the uh, claims that people would somehow get high. The studies are very clear on this as to what it would take. Uh, we've provided you in information as to what someone would have to assume or consume to have any type of effect in the uh, studies. From what I've heard is that people are going to get sick before they have any other uh, type of pleasant experience from uh, uh, involving themselves in ingesting uh, industrial hemp. The, uh, the other part of regarding the, uh, uh, the uh, one of the uh, presenters that you'll hear today is from OSU, uh, Dale Inslinger, is a uh, field crop uh, soil analysis, and he has put together a study at the request of the Oregon Natural Resource Council. Uh, ONRC commissioned this study, and at the time they were looking at whether or not uh, industrial hemp could be a viable substitute for wood-based uh, fiber uh, in production and, and taking off some of the strains off the forest. Uh, I believe what you will be hearing from him today is that under the current economics, 
it is not. We understand why it's not because there's not that, been the ability to have the market establish itself. But on page 32 of the report, it says there is little doubt that industrial hemp can successfully cultivate it in some areas of the Pacific Northwest. It goes on to say, until legislative restrictions are removed from hemp, it is unlikely that the investments in improved production technology will be made or that will, is required for industrial infrastructure to be developed. The bottom line is, as long as the restrictions are in place, the market will never uh, evolve and develop because no one's going to put their capital into that type of uh, uh, venture without knowing that they're going to have some end result at the end. So, I think with that, we need to uh, we need to move along because we have a hearing on another bit. We've got a few people here. Um, we have uh, we have some other people signed up here. We're just not going to be able to get to everyone. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, can I have one more minute? Okay. Uh, I want to clear up two things. The, uh, if you hear about the U University of Kentucky study says it's economically not feasible, don't confuse it with the study that took a year and a half. There's two University of Kentucky studies. Get a copy of the other study, which is four pages. Uh, the other one is the 1% level and uh, the 0.3 level in Europe. The reason they do the 0.3 level is because it's uh, France is the only country that has over the years developed a variety that's that low. They have basically a monopoly on the sea crop. They've got the Canadians tied down because they can't buy. Uh, Canada went into the same thing. They bought into this 0.3%. You, in, in Europe, you can grow something that's above 0.3%, but you don't get the subsidy. So the 0.3 is just a, a red herring that, that gives the, the French a thing. The other thing about subsidies, that you'll hear people say, well, the hemp crop sub, subsidizes in Europe. That's why it's able to grow there. They subsidize everything. 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 Mr. Chair, I want to thank you very much for allowing us to make this presentation in the last closing, as I said on the floor. What we're talking about is a product that is more accustomed to rope, and it's not dope. And I ask you to have fair uh, consideration as to the, uh, the ability to bring a market into this state and establish ourselves before we're trying to play catch up. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, right quick, uh, Lee, uh, bring up Larry Weldy and, and uh, Dr. D.T. Aronson from Oregon State. And then we're going to have to close the hearing here. We have some other people, I think, that are, that are supporting this. Um, we need to hear quickly this viewpoint, and then we'll, we'll close the hearing. So we'd like to uh, you know, don't take too much time. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair Wells, uh, member of the committee. I'm Larry Welty of the Oregon State Police. I'm the Assistant Commander of the Drug Enforcement Section. Uh, I'm not going to go over uh, my full testimony. I'll just cover a few points. Um, uh, I would like to make four points. Uh, the first is, uh, I am a spotter for the Oregon State Police and an aerial observer for marijuana. I have been since about 1984. And uh, I would not be able to distinguish hemp from, uh, industrial hemp from illegal marijuana from the year, number one. Uh, number two, uh, there's a great incentive for diversion here. We're talking about a product that's going to have a 1% THC possibility. Um, if you dilute that into um, a higher uh, THC um, product, uh, marijuana on the street right now is selling for about 300 an ounce. Uh, the shake that they call it, or the leaves that's processed into uh, other products like um, uh, hash oil, it sells for about $50 a pound. Um, the next issue would be uh, they haven't established yet uh, what the um, THC quantity is for impairment to an individual. There has been one, uh, one doctor um, that had from um, the University of Mississippi, uh, late, a letter dated uh, February 17, 1997 to Captain Baker at uh, Mississippi Highway Patrol, um, that a plant with uh, 0.5 to 1% THC uh, contains sufficient uh, THC uh, to produce a high 
or could cause impairment. Uh, the last thing I would like to mention that is, uh, we've already discussed it here today, is the fact that uh, any, any plant that is grown that has any THC in it is uh, illegal as far as the federal government is concerned. With that, I'd like to turn it over. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I find it rather curious that you said that you would not be able to distinguish uh, between the hemp and, and regular commercial marijuana that uh, is smoked, I guess is what you were saying. But um, have you ever been asked to, to do that, to distinguish? I mean, if you've met, that isn't no, a part that of your... The reason, that, the reason I say that is because the, the plants are similar in appearance. They, they have the same... When you're spotting marijuana, you're looking for shape, structure, and color. Um, I remember a number of years ago, uh, they had a hemp plant on display at the Oregon State Fair. <coughs> and the plant looked the same to me as a marijuana plant in that the leaves are fingered, the edges of the leaves are serrated, it is a green plant, and quite frankly, I think what, what gives the plant its color from the air that you see, it's not the same color from the air as it is on the ground, because you're not only seeing the top of the leaves, you're seeing the bottom of the leaves from the ground. From the air, you're seeing the top of the leaves, and I believe what, you're, what I'm seeing, what gives you the flash color, is the THC in the plant. Perhaps if you had, um, did have to distinguish, you would have a training program that could show you the differences, and you would be able to do so. Do you refute that? I, I mean, what you said is just... I, I don't have any idea. On on I'm thing. basing it on is what the plant that I've that I've seen at the State Fair. Thank you. Representative Hill. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, since this is permitted, you would know exactly where these plants are. Uh, so, and so... I would assume in terms of there would be the ability to closely inspect the fields in terms of understand, uh, I understand in terms of running out, grabbing the buds or something, you know, you know, you're not going to be able to control that in that kind of atmosphere, but from a spotting perspective, you're going to know exactly where they're at because everybody is permitted and, uh, and closely inspected. And so, you know, I guess I'm less worried about uh, knowing where the plants are, because we'll know exactly where they are, versus in terms of what is the content of the THC and its practical use. I mean, I think in terms of, uh, you may have people to go out and steal it and sell it, and uh, since criminals are criminals, they're not going to be too concerned about the content. They'll take the money and won't actually get much value out of it. Uh, Chair Wells, Representative Hill. Um, my issue would be is, is that when I'm spotting marijuana, I can't tell from the air what the THC con of the marijuana is. I um, mean, I don't know if I'm observing a field of 1%, 5%, or 25%. But what would I mean if you see, you know, five acres of marijuana, and you go and you drive up to it, and you're going to know that this is a licensed facility for industrial hemp, right? versus a small plot out in the middle of the woods someplace, I, you know, that's where I'm distinguishing between a large acreage hemp production versus, you know, a covert out in the woods, up in the mountains type of a production, or in the middle of a cornfield. Well, I, I don't know where it's going to be grown. I, I couldn't tell you where they would be growing it. Um, and, and again, I would still have no, no way of knowing what the THC content of what I'm observing is. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Decker. I just have a question, just along the same lines as that. It seems to me if, if you have a permit process where you would know and, and, and the Department of Agriculture knows and you can, we could write, you know, they have to have a big sign that says, uh, Mr. Larson's hemp bill, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this big sign and it's permitted, that just seems to me so different than uh, either aerial or, or on the ground than some <laughs> some operation without the big sign on it and without the permit. And that's an easy way, at least for me, I would think, to distinguish between what's permitted and what's not permitted. A represent well. So. The corner, corner of the bill here would be a contiguous field of industrial hemp grown under a license. So evidently we would know where the field was. Uh, yes, sir. And, and I don't have the issue with that. The problem is, is you could be mixing uh, your uh, low-quality 
1% legal THC uh, hemp along with the high quality. And if they have the permit, I observe it from the air and I can't tell whether it's 1% or 20%. What allows me to go on that property, law enforcement to go on that property to seize and test? Yeah, but that, we need to move along with that. Let's, let's go to uh, Philip Morgan State. We do have to get this other bill. Uh, my name is Daryl Aronsing. I'm an agronomist with the Crop and Soil Science Department at Oregon State University, and I've spent about 20 years working there on uh, production and introduction of uh, new alternative crops. So I work with uh, commercial growers every day on uh, small and large scales. and. Uh, I was approached by the Oregon Natural Resources uh, Council in 1997 to try to put together a report, and a lot of their concern about hemp was a lot of the exaggeration that was going on in terms of uh, popular publications that were coming out about hemp and making all kinds of, of uh, wild claims about it. And uh, really, you'll find uh, this is quite a controversial issue, as you're no doubt well aware, and the, the uh, polls have been formed. You end up with a one group that's telling you that hemp is the wonder crop that's going to save the world and meet all of our needs for every possible thing we could ever want. And the other group is saying this is the demon weed that's going to be the end of society. Well, I may be the only person in the room who has no particular axe to grind about hemp. To me, it's simply another crop. And uh, so I'm not really going to testify for or against. I'm a neutral party. And I think that's the, the place of the university in this. Uh, Hemp obviously has a long history of production. Uh, the fiber's been used for centuries. Uh, the, uh, the beginning of its use really predates written history. And it's been moved all around the world and grown in a lot of different places. It's very adaptable around the world to different environments. But there are a lot of other crops that do that too. Um, crops like flax, which is a major crop here in the Lama Valley for, for a number of years. Uh, is a good competing crop that produces similar kinds of fiber. Uh, the main things I'd like to get across with hemp is that it's really adapted to the Midwest. Uh, that's where it grows well. It'll grow a lot of places, but I think the, uh, the optimum environment to grow it really is in the Corn Belt. The old rule from the agronomists back in the 30s that grew it as part of the, the hemp programs. Uh, actually, the leader of that whole program came from Oregon and, uh, and went to work there. Uh, was wherever you can grow good corn, you can grow good hemp. So let's look at the places where you can do that in the Pacific Northwest. You're primarily looking at highly productive agricultural soils, uh, river basins in the Columbia River, uh, in uh, the Snake River Basin, and uh, in western Oregon uh, under irrigation. This is going to be almost strictly an irrigated crop. There are very few areas in the region where it could be grown in any other way. Uh, it's a crop that requires abundant moisture through, throughout the growing season, and uh, so that's why it's primarily grown in high rainfall areas, high summer rainfall areas. It's also a crop that needs substantial nutrients available, and, uh, and you need a, a reasonably good uh, growing season and plenty of hot weather. The problem with doing this kind of feasibility study, and I've got copies of it to pass out to you, uh, is that we really aim this uh, looking at replacing uh, raw materials for the production of panels <laughs> composite wood products. And the economics of that, of course, are very different than some other products. If you're looking at a high-end textile product or a, a, uh, an oilseed crop, the economics of that can be very different. The problem we have is the only way to really prove this out is to be able to grow the crop. It hasn't been grown here since the 1930s. And, uh, so you haven't grown any So we haven't grown any of it. This, this study is based completely on the literature that's available from Europe, and from Canada, and from other regions, and we're under extrapolating law, that. Under current yeah. law, could we grow uh, anything at Oregon State? It is, uh, any scientific it's, research it's theoretically that? possible to apply to the DEA for permits that the restrictions that they impose on you have effectively uh, eliminated that possibility. Okay. Uh, what is this?